good to have him here with us. Luke chapter 22, by means of introduction, if you're familiar with the Old Testament and if you're familiar with Judaism, which was the beginning really of God working to give us Christianity, Judaism is the womb from which Christianity was born, God gave the Jewish people there in the wilderness through Moses all these precepts, lots of them, not just Ten Commandments, which is maybe the stereotype of Judaism. But he gave them all these precepts, a lot of them, dietary precepts, uh, how you built your roofs, what you wore, what you ate, how you worshipped, the sacrifices. All of these things were very detailed. And God was making sure that his people knew exactly what was expected of them. God was an excellent and is an excellent communicator. He doesn't hold anybody accountable for something they cannot be aware of needing to do. So when he says take the garbage out and someone doesn't take the garbage out, he makes sure that everyone knows they were supposed to take the garbage out before he holds them accountable. And so God was very clear in giving the law, in fact, multiple times because God gave the law to the Hebrew people at the beginning of their journey in the wilderness and then really once again, God went through it with them before they entered the promised land. So there'd be no questions as to what the Jewish people were supposed to do and what they were not supposed to do. But God also wanted his people to go beyond the what. He wanted them to know why God wanted them to do what they were supposed to do. See, the why is just as important as the what. God designed our minds. He designed us to be very curious. He designed us to be intellectual. He designed and wired our minds so he knows exactly how we think. And we've been designed to think and process everything we do. Going throughout the day, we're always evaluating why we're going to stop at this red light, why we're going to go at this green light, why we do what we do at, at, at home, why we do what we do at, at the job site, why it is politicians do what they do, why it is our wife does what she does, why it is our husband does what he does. We're always processing things constantly. We have this incredible computer in our head that is always working, always learning. This intellectual uh, tendency of our race is what gives this world some color, what keeps us going. Children ask when they grow up, why? Right? And if we're not careful as adults, we'll interpret that as rebellious, as resisting. But in nature, yeah, kids don't like going to school. You know why? Because they don't see a purpose in it. Because they're kids. Why do I have to go to school? Well, They're asking, what are they wasting their life away for learning when they could be playing? It's the job of a parent, it's the job of a teacher to explain to the child, this is why you're going to school. Do you want to eat food when you get older? Yes. I'm not going to be there when you get older. Oh, oh really? How are you going to buy that food? With money? Where's the money come from? I don't know. It comes from working. How do you get a job? Uh, I don't know. You get a job by going to school. Oh, now as they age, that should set in, and now there's a purpose to go not just to grade school and high school, but college? Okay, there's a reason we have to go, because they understand it. People still today don't understand. Why do I have to pay my taxes? The government's done a terrible job explaining that if you don't pay your taxes, you won't have roads to drive on. The government has done a terrible job explaining that if you don't pay your taxes, you won't have an army to protect you. You see, when people don't have a reason to do what they are doing, eventually they stop doing what they're doing. It's all about having a reason. That's why our, our minds work the way they do. I think of coaches. If coaches cannot communicate to their, to, their, to their athletes why they're implementing this defensive play or this offensive approach or why it is they're conditioning or why it is they're practicing the way they do, if they don't convince their athletes those answers to their questions, those reasons, the athletes will not learn. They will not keep practicing. They will not listen to the coaches and everything will fall apart. It's no different for any trade, for any skill, for any situation. And so God, getting back to him in the Old Testament, he immediately, when implementing the Passover, addressed this curious nature of mankind. He said in Exodus chapter 12, when giving the Jewish people the Passover before they were to leave Egypt, he said, and it shall come to pass. God says, I know what's going to happen. It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service? 
Because children who didn't grow up in Egypt under the bondage of the Egyptians, or young children who would remember the bondage in Egypt, they would, years later, they would sit down and have that, that lamb. They would have their Seder supper. They would go through these rituals. They would read the scripture. Uh, they would talk about it. And at some point, young Jewish children would say to mom and dad, why are we doing this? Why am I spending all night, every time this year, eating this meal and the way we do it and rehearsing these scriptures. Why can't I play with, with Billy? God was telling his people, if you don't explain it to your kids, eventually they'll stop doing it when they have the freedom and liberty to stop doing it. And if they stop observing the Passover, then their children won't learn to observe the Passover. And eventually history will be lost. And the nation will forget that I rescued them out of Egypt because my rescuing the Jewish people out of Egypt would be the motivation and the reminder that I love them and they are to serve me all the days of their lives. There needed to be a reason to the questions. In Deuteronomy 6, verse number 20, when the law was given again, God said these words. He said, and when, not if, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Oh, they can read it in the Pentateuch. They can pick up their own copy of the law, and they can read the what and the what not. But they want to know, why does God want us to kill these animals? Why doesn't God want us to eat pork? Why are we supposed to rest on the seventh day? And it wouldn't be good enough. God knew this. It wouldn't be good enough to tell their kids because God said so. Because that's the way we've always done it. Because it's tradition and you're Hebrew. That's not good enough for a kid. Later on, they would come into the promised land. And God said, take 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan River. Set them up for a monument, a memorial. And, and this is what the scripture says in Joshua 4, 6. When, not if, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? Why are these stones here? Why are we doing what we're doing? You need to have an answer for them. It's the same reason in the New Testament, we are told in 1 Peter 3.15 to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. People aren't going to come to Christ until they realize why you need to come to Christ. Sadly, Tragically, so many young people who grow up in Christian homes, they move on, they move out, and never darken the doors of church again. So often, it's so more common for this to happen than for children to grow up and choose the God of their fathers. So often, children are, are raised in a Christian home. They come to church each week. They have a Bible. They sing the songs. But as they age they don't see the significance or the reason for doing what they do. And as soon as they get out of the house, when they no longer have to come to church, when they no longer have to carry a Bible, they stop coming to church. They stop carrying a Bible. You say, what happened? Well, they're carnal. They're wicked. They're evil. They just reject God. There's a part of that certainly there. We all have a free will. We all resist truth. We all, at times in our life, make terrible decisions. But I would argue the bigger reason for the substantial loss of youth in our churches is because pastors and parents are not convincing and persuading our young people for the reason in which they should be coming to church. We're not showing our young people enough to believe that the Bible is necessary for success in life. And when they don't know why we're doing what we're doing, they eventually stop doing what they were doing. It's all about persuading. This is true for everything. Listen, uh, from the beginning, but even now, the social distancing in our country is getting less distant. The masks are getting less frequent. Why is that? Because the government has not successfully persuaded their people that that will stop COVID. When the scientists say it won't help, and then they say it will help, and then they say it may help, and then they say we're not sure if it will help, and then they say it absolutely will help, the average person says, you don't know the answer, do you? And so if we're not persuaded that there's a reason to wear it, 
people stop doing what they do. That's just the way we all are. So with this in mind, I guess I ask this question not to be answered out loud, but why in the world do we observe the Lord's Supper? Why do we have the trays in front of us this morning? Why are we about to wrestle with a little cup and pull off the seal and eat this little piece of bread and drink this little portion of juice? Why do we do what we do? Do we do it simply because that's what we've always done? Do we do it because it's tradition in Christianity to observe the Lord's Supper? Now, I know many of you are thinking, oh, I know why we do it. Because Paul said, for as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. That's why we do it. No, that's the what. That's what we're doing. We're showing the Lord's death till he come. My question is, why? Why do we show the Lord's death till we come? Why are we gathering now and going to have this quiet time of reflection and devotion in our seats. Well, I'll tell you why, and we're going to go through it in detail, and in relatively short detail, but uh, simply put, it's good for us. It's good for us to partake of these sacred symbols of the body of Christ being broken for us and the blood of Christ being shed for us. It's spiritual nutrition. Let's look in Luke 22, and we'll point out three things in this short passage. In verse number one of Luke 22, we read this historical truth. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Verse seven, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. So they're having this Passover dinner, what we would know as the Seder dinner, together, Jesus and his 12 disciples, his 12 apostles. Verse 13, and they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But... Behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Why do we do what we do when we observe the Lord's Supper? You might refer to it as Holy Communion. Why did Christ institute this local church ordinance? And number one, very simply, because it sobers the soul. It sobers the soul. And you realize this is not the first time Jesus told the apostles he was going to suffer. Well before this moment, Jesus took his disciples aside and he said, guys, I gotta tell you this information. You're not gonna like it, but I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. The chief priests and the elders, they're gonna make me suffer something bad. So he told them. He got their attention. He told them that he's going to suffer. And you know what the, the, the disciples did, the apostles? They turned to Jesus and said, no, you're not. That's exactly what Peter said. Far be it from you, Lord, you're not gonna die. And that's when Jesus said, boy, shut your mouth. Remember that? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's the same way of, of us saying that. What did the other apostles do? Nothing. They, they, they all just kind of looked at him like, no, you're not. And they went on with their, their merry lives. This moment would be different because for the first time, Jesus would sit them down and he's going to give them some bread. He's going to give them some juice. And he's going to explain to them as they partake of that bread, as they partake of that juice, he said, gentlemen, I want you to think of what you're chewing. I want you to think of what you're tasting. I want you to think about what you're consuming. And I want you to think 
Don't answer. Just think. That is my body being broken between your teeth for you. That is my blood being shed, that juice that goes down your throat. I want you to think about the suffering I'm going to endure. Now for the first time. The apostles who heard words and it went right through their head, they now have to experience what Jesus was saying in a very different way. You know, words can sometimes be just words. So easily ignored. So easily missed so easily disregarded. That's why in our homes, whether it's couples or parents to their children, we often say, I told you this already. Do we not? We often say, you already asked me that. Or we say, weren't you listening? You know, words are like a waste of time sometimes, aren't they? I can tell you here in the ministry, Pastor Phil and I laugh all the time, we're convinced we're awful communicators. Absolutely convinced of it. Terrible communicators. You say, why? Because you would be shocked how many people come up to me right after I announce it, post it, uh, make it clear on the website, the app, tell you from announcements. I'll tell you what's happening this week. And people come up to me and say, so what's happening this week? Was I not speaking? I must not have been speaking. I'm a bad communicator. No, you know why? Because words are just words. That's why you almost never hear the whole sermon. That's why it's so hard to grasp what a teacher or preacher is saying. Because words are words. Who cares? You know what makes a word more impactful? You combine it with something you can touch. Combine it with something you can feel. You know when you listen to words? It's when you're in a doctor's office and the doctor is showing you the the lab reports on the screen. And when he puts his hand on your hand and says, I've got bad news for you, you're listening to those words. Jesus was doing the same thing. He says, I told you before, you guys didn't care, you didn't hear it, you don't remember it? Now take this bread Take this juice, put it in your mouth, have the senses of your taste, have the senses of your touch, and feel the vibration in your skull when you crack on that cracker. That's my body being broken very soon. That's my blood being shed very soon. Oh, and by the way, at the table right here is the man that's going to betray me to be then given to the priest where I will then suffer. Don't you think this moment... For the first time in three and a half years when Jesus would work with the disciples, they were sober. They were finally reflecting upon the suffering of Jesus Christ. Oh, sure. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Simply because it sobers the soul. And that is really good for us. This morning we woke, and for most of us, the first thing we thought about was us. For the first thing, we th- uh, first thing we thought about was what we were going to accomplish that day or what it was we were looking forward to. Uh, maybe for you diehard football fans, football's finally here. I get to watch the Bills and I get to sit around and, and enjoy football this afternoon. I get to have maybe my favorite meal today or I'm gonna see my friend at church or I get to put on my, my clothes or I get to get in my fancy car. So many of us get so caught up. In fact, all of us get so caught up in this world, do we not? You know what this morning is going to do for us? It's going to sober our souls. It's going to remind us what's important in life and what's not important in life. Because as you sit in your seat and you crack on this not hard bread, it'll be very soft, and you, you, you take that bread in your mouth and you have to think about the body of Christ being broken. You, you go and in your mind, you take yourself to a place where Jesus' hands were nailed to this cross and thorns were nailed into his head and you envision the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, the sinless Lamb of God, uh, pouring from his veins and you have, to, you have to confront that and when you think about Jesus' suffering and his death, does football matter anymore? Does it matter what meal you're going to have? Here's the big thing. Does it matter what she said to make you so upset? When you think about the suffering of Jesus, does it matter what he did to make you so worked up? Oh no, see the suffering of Christ puts life in perspective. It sorts out the important from the unimportant. It tells us what we should be concerned about, what we shouldn't be concerned about. The Lord's Supper goes beyond the ears and involves the senses, and it brings a sincere reflection of the death of Christ, and that brings sobriety to our soul. And the more sobriety we welcome in, the better we are. Children don't have sobriety by age, do they? A three- and four-year-old is not sober. They're just high on whatever life offers them. 
as a result, do they offer any virtue to this world? No. They make us laugh. They're fun. But they don't offer anything to this world. We're just sometimes big kids with big toys. Because we get so caught up with what we want, we don't offer anything to this world. The Lord's Supper brings us down and reminds us, it's just a truck, man. It's just a, it's just a house, ladies. The paint on the wall, it's pretty, but does it really matter? What he said, what she said, what they didn't say, what social media maybe reminded you of that you didn't like, hey, doesn't matter. Because that makes everything in our life seem so much different, does it not? Number two, look at verse number 19. And Jesus took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Why do we take the time and the effort to do what seems to be a, a very simple ritual? Well, number one, it, it brings sobriety to our soul, and that's so healthy for us. But number two, it heals our heart. And that's good for us. You say, heals our, how does it heal our heart? Well, the reality is this room has got, I don't know, 200 people in it. In a room of 200 people, insecurity oozes from every vein of every seat. We're all insecure. No matter how bold that one looks like or no matter how confident that person so seems, we're all super insecure. Do you know how I know this? Because I'm human. I watch humans. And then I've been watching for four years the most important and most powerful man in the world who has all the money you could ask for, has all the attention you could crave, feels like he needs to answer every critic. And I watched for eight years the most powerful man in the world who had all the popularity in America and around the world, who was the golden child of the world for eight years. If somebody criticized him, he had to step to the podium and, and point his finger and rebuke whoever criticized him. You know what that tells me? We could have the support and enthusiastic favor of the entire world, but if there's one person who doesn't like us, we focus on that one person. We're all, we're all insecure, every one of us. Every single one of us. So what, what that means is we live with emotional pain every day. A lot of you ladies wake up today and wish you woke up to another man, meaning a better man. A, a lot of you men woke up today, wish you'd wake up to another woman, a better woman in your mind because she doesn't respect me and he doesn't love me and she doesn't make me feel important and he doesn't make me feel num like number one. And then you think, by the way, my big sister, she's ignored me for years. My big brother, he never gives me any attention. My boss doesn't appreciate me. My kids don't appreciate me. Uh, you could have everything you want, but there's still something you focus on that you wish you had from somebody else because we're all insecure. This world is emotionally tormentuous. There's so much pain. So much pain. I could probably talk to anybody in my office. If I talk to them long enough, their eyes will swell with tears. I just need to get to the right relationship that I know there's heartbreak. It's amazing how hard it is to get the love of somebody else in this world. And if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'm loved by lots of people, you're not loved by people the way you think you are. I'll talk about it tonight, but we live in a world with what's called conditional love. There is no such thing as unconditional love in our world. Some of you are arguing with me right now in your hearts, mothers especially. Oh, I love my child unconditionally. I don't doubt that you have a love for them unconditionally. I doubt whether you love them unconditionally. Because as soon as they slap you in the face or spit in your face or, or stab you in the back or don't give you what you want, don't tell me the first affection you feel is love. You feel rejection. You feel hurt. You feel betrayal. That's the life we live. Everyone. Everyone. So what's going to happen this morning is you're going to take this bread, you're going to take this juice, you're going to partake of it in the quietness of your seat, and you're going you're to think again, Why? 
Why? There's that looking for a reason. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he put his body on the cross to be, to be beaten and to be crucified? Why did he let his side be pierced and his head be pierced? Why did he shed his blood? Well, we're reminded this morning, he did it for you, and he did it for me. You know what happens this morning in the privacy of your heart when you think about your son-in-law and what he's done to you? You think about your daughter-in-law and what she's done to you? You think about the people that have forgotten you, forsaken you? You think about the people who have promised to help you and didn't show up? You know what happens when you partake of the Lord's Supper there in the privacy of your mind and heart? You think, I've got a friend. I've got somebody who loves me. If Jesus was willing to die for me, then I've got at least one person I can count on that I know uh, loves me dearly, loves me unconditionally. Jesus knows who I am. Jesus knows who you are better than anyone else. And yet he still decided to give his body for you. He still decided to give his blood for you. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Well, because it heals our broken hearts. This morning, everyone who knows the saving grace of Jesus Christ should walk away with warmth in their heart, with comfort in their soul, and should realize that you have the love, affection, care, and support of the most significant one in all of existence. God Almighty. Maybe everybody doesn't like you. Maybe everybody rejects you. I've told my wife on numerous occasions, very few people around me are ever real. Because I'm a pastor, and and the pastor must be different, so I have to be different, and very rarely are people real with me. It's a lonely life, which means people don't often accept me. Here I am whining to you. I, I apologize. It's the, it's the plight of the pastor. Talk with Pastor Nugent's For 36 years, he understands. You know how good it is to know that Jesus loves me for exactly who I am, which is rotten, which is rotten. He gave his body for me. And so this morning as I partake, I'm not thinking about who doesn't love me. I'm thinking I got somebody who does love me. That's why we observe the Lord's Supper. Look at verse number 15. Let's look at number three. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? It's an interesting detail I found in the story, and we could argue semantics some other time, in particular dealing with the Seder Supper. But in verse 15, Jesus says to his disciples, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. I like that detail because it tells me the Lord's Supper, as Christ intended it, was to sober their their minds and their souls. It was to heal their hearts. But for them and for us today, it's to bond the body of Christ. You know what Jesus could have done? He could have taken the elements and he could have served each of the 12 apostles himself. Could he not have? That would have been very intimate. But he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. What was he doing? It was a team building exercise. Didn't these guys argue all the time? Weren't these clowns always after each other? I'm the greatest, like Muhammad Ali. There's like 12 of them in the same room all the time. Yeah, the body of Christ has a chance to exercise humility and to treat each other equally. Divide this among yourselves. Make sure everybody gets the same amount. Make sure everybody gets some. Make sure you're all looking at each other the way I look at you, which is equal. No, nobody's greater than each other here. No one's more important than anyone here. You're all equal. Why? Because all of you share the same facts You're sinners, and Jesus died for you, period. This morning, as we gather 200 people, we're going to take the same wafer. No one got the golden wafer in your little cup there. You're going to take the same juice. No one got the golden, you know, fountain of youth in your little cup. We all have the same cup, the same bread, the same juice, and we're going to sit in the same chairs, and we're going to think about the same Messiah dying for the same souls because we're all the same. This morning... As we sit here and reflect upon our Savior and his death, we think, hey, there's a lot of people in this room that share the same Savior, the same faith. We're not going through life alone. In fact, 
Even though that guy or that gal may look like she does more in the church or have more to offer Christ, Jesus died for me just as much as he did for her, just as much as he did for him. We're all the same. It's a chance for us to bond. I mentioned last hour in the instructions for the Lord's Supper that pre-COVID we used to pass the plates. And I love the picture of sharing dinner together, right? You're sitting around a table and you're passing the mashed potatoes around. You're passing the carrots around. What are you doing during dinner when you're sharing? You're bonding. You're letting your hair down and we're all family. We're all together. Uh, you, you may be an engineer, big bro, but I'm eating the same food you are. We're, we're all together, young and old alike. Doesn't matter who pays the bills. Doesn't matter who made the food. We're all sitting here. We're all eating the same thing. We're all together. We're one happy family. Now, we can't pass the plate today, but we did divide among ourselves. We did have you get in the line. We did have the deacons and ushers distribute among ourselves. And this morning, remember, we are one. We are all together. We are all heading to the same place. We all came from the same origin. We are taking the same vehicle. We are forgiven by the same blood. When we get to heaven, this is exactly what we'll experience. One unified body with no issues, no problems. This morning, you may have an issue with Sister Susie over here or Brother Billy over there, but as you eat and as you partake, you have to realize Jesus died for them too. Ah. You, you got to think, oh man, she's going to be in heaven. I got to put up with her all eternity. Now it's a chance for you to be sober. Heal your heart. Put things in perspective. If Jesus loves her, I love her. If Jesus puts up with him, I'm going to put up with him. Because we are today. We're feasting together as a family. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? Well, it's because what we always do. No, there's a reason. There's a reason. Going through COVID, some people asked me this. Are we going to ever observe the Lord's Supper? And I said, yeah, at some point. I don't know how to do it. We'll figure that out. But as time went on, there was a growing, a growing desire in my heart to observe the Lord's Supper. Why? To get you off my back? No. No. Why? Because we need it. Because it's spiritual nutrition what we need today is a time to sober our souls, to put things in perspective. What do we need today? There's a lot of hurt out there. There's a lot of hurt in those seats. You need to be reminded in vivid fashion with your senses engaged that that bread, that, that juice, it's symbolic that Jesus did it for you. You need to walk out of here with your chin high thinking somebody, somebody loves me. And why are we doing this? Because we need to unify we need to get bonded. And this is a simple way of doing those three things. There is a reason. There is a reason. Let's have a word of prayer. Jen, Nancy, if you'd come forward.